welcome. I would like to welcome all, all, all our colleagues from the community to this second webinar, which is uh, our, you know, SPS uh, webinar series that started two weeks ago. Today we have a, a distinguished uh, speaker that I was just mentioning has been uh, uh, actually uh, chairing COSP uh, for three years so since 2013 until 2016. And uh, Anton Tyrek is mem is a faculty member of uh, of the um, uh, Institute of uh, the Stuart, sorry the Stuart School of Industrial and Systems Engineering at Georgia Tech, and uh, also uh, we know his research interests include stochastic optimization applications to transportation revenue management. I must say that Anton is. Uh, also uh, very interested in collaborating on, on financial applications, uh, particularly uh, using distribution robust optimization. And uh, he participated, he started this you know, collaboration and participation to the Sokasi programming uh, series of, uh, um, of uh, conferences in Tucson 2004. And, at the, and then he, he was, as I was mentioning, he was part of COSP from 2010 to 2016. So I would like to mention two works that uh, I regard that are, have been contributed by Anton and which are very, very dear to the Sokasi programming community uh, as large, at least two. One is the paper that he, he submitted and published on the same journal of optimization with uh, Alexander Shapiro and, and Tito Holman de Mayo on sample average approximation for stochastic discrete optimization. And then this is from 2002, is one of the most cited articles in our community. And then more recently, uh, maybe not everybody knows that uh, his work on distribution robust optimization uh, was has been published after being for quite some time uh, in the archive uh, uh, series has been published by Mathematics of Operations Research. So these two, these two paper are, are, are uh, well founding uh, several uh, areas of research and he promotes the Wasserstein distance in the distribution robust approach. So today he will, he will be presenting a paper uh, on uh, uh, title optimizing, pricing, repositioning, and pick at time and idle time in right hailing systems. So that looks very, very interesting. So we look forward to hear, to listen to you, uh, Anton. And please, uh, if you need to uh, put down questions or remarks, at the end, we will be, we will leave uh, 15 minutes for discussion and, you know, and feedbacks and comments. So I leave the words to you, Anton, and thanks for accepting our invitation. So I, I, I'm grateful to, to have introduced him and uh, uh, on behalf of the COSP committee, so Phoebe uh, Bajanos is our chair, and then we have here all this. Mel, uh, uh, Mel is, our, is uh, collaborating to establish this series, and then uh, we have all the other members, uh, Bernardo, Wolfram, Wim and Vincent, and also when we avoid, uh, yes, I think I said everybody, and Walt uh, as member of the COSP currently. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Giorgio. It's um, always nice to talk with you. So as Giorgio mentioned, we're going to talk about ride-hailing systems. So I think everybody is familiar with ride hailing systems, but I hope that by the end of this, you will have, you'll learn something interesting and new. Um, so let's see if we can, all right. So um, up there is the, the parts of the talk. So we're going to first talk about um, why pick up time and idle time as part of the title of this talk. And, um, and that's because there's a trade off between the two that so far has been mostly ignored in the literature on, on controlling ride hailing systems. All right, so to begin with, let's uh, just briefly go over the kind of the, the life of a trip request and a, and a, and a vehicle in, 
in this process. So we'll start at the top. Um, so there's a request that's received from a rider, usually through an app. Um, when that request is received, um, the, the marketplace uh, offers a price and maybe some other information to, um, to the requester. The requester then makes a decision. Now, either the right offer is declined or the right offer is accepted. If the right offer is accepted, then the marketplace has to dispatch a vehicle to, to transport the rider. So a vehicle that's currently available, or what we call an idle vehicle, is dispatched. This vehicle has, has to travel from the vehicle's current location, where it, when it is dispatched, to where the rider has to be picked up. And that trip, uh, or that travel, we call the pickup travel. Um, then the rider is picked up. And then the rider is transported from the rider's origin to the rider's destination. So that trip we call the, on, or that travel we call on trip travel. Uh, then the rider is dropped off. When the rider is dropped off, there typically is a decision to be made. Um, in a human driven vehicle, the human makes, the driver makes this decision. But in our model, we came to consider a setting where that the marketplace can make the decision. And that is whether the, the vehicle should stay where it is or whether the vehicle should reposition to a different place. So there's a repositioning decision. If it's decided to reposition the vehicle, then the vehicle has to travel from where the rider was dropped off to the repositioning destination. And then the, uh, the vehicle becomes uh, idle and available for the next dispatch. So in brief, that's kind of the life of a trip and the life of a car. Uh, we came to look at the the steps in this process in more detail. First, let's make a few observations. Um, so these are obvious observations, but um, they are important for what we're doing. So I, I, um, I want to emphasize this. Uh, first is vehicles are productive when they're transporting riders. So, um, and we have a limited amount of vehicle time available. So our, our main resource here is vehicle time. And so we want to maximize the amount of this vehicle time that we have available for on-trip travel. So the other things that the vehicle spends its time on that we just discussed, like the pickup time, pickup time again is the time it takes to travel from where the vehicle is dispatched to where the rider is picked up. So the pickup time, the idle time, the repositioning time, et cetera, that takes away from the vehicle time that's available for transporting riders. So this is the unproductive time and we want to reduce the time on these activities. Um, so we want to uh, minimize all of these. Uh, the, the, the issue is that we cannot make both pickup time and idle time small simultaneously because there's a trade-off. This is it's this trade-off that's been ignored in much of the literature on ride hailing, controlling ride hailing systems. So a fundamental phenomenon in a ride hailing system is this trade-off between pickup time and idle time. When you try to make one smaller, the other one will become larger. And, and I'm going to use a simple example to illustrate this. Or the, the idea is simple, but let's go through an example. So, so first suppose there are relatively few vehicles uh, that are idle. So in other words, uh, vehicles spend relatively little time being idle. So in this example, we have three idle vehicles in this, in this area. Um, that's going to be a small number compared to the example I'll show next. Okay, so in this case, it results in, on average, in a longer distance between the rider's origin and the closest available vehicle. So that leads uh, to a longer pickup distance and uh, uh, at the same time, a longer uh, average pickup time. Now, in the next example that we see here, there are more idle vehicles and therefore on average, the pickup distance and pickup time is shorter. Okay, so what we are trying to do in this work is we're trying to optimize ride hailing systems. We can to con consider two main types of decisions, pricing and empty repositioning. 
And specifically, we want to consider this trade-off between idle time and pickup time in our model of the, of the ride hailing system. And that has important consequences, um, as, we, as I'm going to illustrate. So first, to illustrate these consequences I've just referred to, I'm going to start with a kind of a, a minimal or a simple motivating analysis. Although it is very simple, it will contain some key insights. And these key insights are going to continue to hold when we look at the more detailed and more realistic model. Okay, so this, this simple model that captures the trade-off between pickup time and idle time is not our model. It was uh, originally pointed out by Arnett in a paper that had to do with subsidizing taxis. Um, but as I mentioned, the key insight was already there. And then this insight has been used in other uh, papers, like the, the well-known work by Castillo and, and Al, and a more recent work by Shu and et al. Um, so these papers, they quantify this trade-off between pickup time and idle time. And a, a simple setting um, where the pickup locations in the vehicles are uniformly distributed over a space without boundaries. And, and we're going to briefly go over this model in, in just a little bit. Um, and again, we, we want to look at this because even the simple setting exhibits key phenomena um, that are going to be important uh, also in our later model. So in this model, as I mentioned, we consider a homogeneous space. There are no boundaries. And it's assumed that the idle vehicles are distributed according to say, a two-dimensional Poisson process um, with a rate, uh, we call the rate A of this Poisson process. That rate is endogenous, so it has to be explained by the model. It is not input. And later on, we'll get to the calculations where this rate is determined. And then uh, how it works is, as I described earlier, when a ride request is received, um, the closest idle vehicle is dispatched to go pick up the rider. And therefore, the distribution of pickup distance and pickup time will depend on this density of idle vehicles, as, as we've explained before. And the exact dependence, this function of pickup time is a function of the density of idle vehicles we're going to derive in a few minutes. All right, so to derive that, so let's use capital T to denote the pickup time, and we'll use V to denote the vehicle speed. So as a result, the probability that the pickup time is larger than some number little t is the same as the Poisson probability that there are that is no idle vehicle in a neighborhood around the pickup location with a radius uh, speed times little t. And so as a result, we get this expression on the screen for the probability distribution of the pickup time. So you can see it looks like an exponential distribution. In this expression, there's an omega, and this omega is just some a, a constant that depends on the type of metric that you use for travel. So you could, uh, it's different depending on whether you say L1 or L2 distance or some other metric. Okay, next, um, you may say, well, if, if the pickup distance is a really long, um, it's going, or pickup time is really long, it's going to take half an hour to do a pickup. Typically what a ride hailing um, marketplace would do is to tell the rider that there is no vehicle available. So although they say there's no vehicle available, of course, it, it doesn't exactly mean that. It just means there's no vehicle available close enough to you. So let's suppose we follow such a rule, and that will also be important in later calculations. So let's specifically, let's suppose we impose a maximum tick pickup time, this T max. And so if the, the pickup time from the closest idle vehicle to the pickup location is more than T max, we just tell the rider, sorry, there's no vehicle available, and this ride request goes away. Otherwise, the closest available vehicle will be dispatched. So using that, we can also calculate the probability distribution of the pickup time, given that a pickup takes place. So given that the pickup time is less than this maximum value. Now, there's a trade-off, of course, in choosing this maximum value too, because 
if you choose a smaller Tmax, then the expected pickup time, given that there's a pickup, will be smaller. But there will also be more write requests that have to be rejected because the pickup time is more than this, this, this cutoff value. So now that we have the distribution of the pickup time for the two settings, one with, with a cutoff and one without a cutoff, we can also calculate the expected pickup time. And um, especially in the first expression, with, without a cutoff, you can see what is the relationship between expected pickup time and idle vehicle density. Remember, little a denotes the idle vehicle density. And so you can see from this expression that the expected pickup time is proportional to the inverse square root of the idle density. So as idle density decreases, the pickup time will increase and, and vice versa. And the same is true even when you use a cutoff of Tmax, it's just that it's not so obvious to see this. To see what it looks like, let's look a picture of this. So in this figure, um, we have on the horizontal axis, the idle vehicle density. And, and this is the density is, is a fraction of the total number of vehicles. So the idle vehicle density and this figure varies between zero and one. And on the vertical axis, we have the mean pickup time. And that's for different values of Tmax. And you can see here, you know, unless Tmax is small, the, the mean pickup time increases very fast when the idle density becomes small. So a few, so it, you can already see from this that having a small number of available vehicles or equivalently having your vehicle spend little time being idle will result in very large values for the, the mean pickup time. And that's, a, that's, of course, a bad thing. So the next thing we want to do, and, and you'll see in a, in a few minutes why we want to do this, is we want to calculate the steady states of this, of this system. Now, I say steady states, and it's not a typo on, in, the, in the header here. Um, we're going to see that there are actually multiple steady states, or well, there can be multiple steady states. Okay, so um, as a reminder, we have certain input to this model. Um, one input is the overall vehicle density that will denote with a row. Um, in brackets here, I just denoted the units of this uh, in case it, it makes it easier to, to remember. Um, we have a mean on trip time, so the mean time from the origin to the destination of a rider. And then we have a ride request arrival rate, which is lambda. And then we also have the rider's acceptance rate uh, that will denote with P. So this model, there's no distinction really between lambda and P, but in our later model, the P will become endogenous and that will be important. So um, I'm going to at this stage already make a distinction between lambda and P. And then the endogenous variables, so the variables that we want to derive are the idle vehicle density A as before, then also the pickup vehicle density. So that's the, the, the density or the say an average number of vehicles busy traveling from the location where they dispatch to the pickup location. And then we have the on-trip vehicle density. So that's the, the density or the number of vehicles that are busy transporting a rider from the rider's origin to the rider's destination. And then the other variable that I've already referred to that we want to, that we want to explain is the mean pickup time. And here we'll denote the mean pickup time with one over new. So on the right side of the screen, you can see the first expression is exactly the same expression we derived before for the, the main pickup time if there's no cutoff for the pickup time. And the other two are directly derived from Little's law for the, the pickup vehicle density and the on-trip vehicle density. Now we can also do the same for the setting in which there's a cutoff but in that case, we're going to need another endogenous variable. And that is, that's the probability that the right request is rejected or that the right request is not rejected because its pickup time is you know, less or more, um, sorry, more or less than the, the cutoff. 
So we'll denote that with Q. Q is the probability that the right request is not discarded. So on the screen there, the first expression for mean pickup time is the one we derived earlier. The next expression is simply the expression that uh, for Q, that the right request is not discarded. In other words, that there is a vehicle in the neighborhood of the pickup location um, close enough. So the pickup time will be less than the cutoff. And then again, the next two, two expressions for D and F follow directly from Little's law. So if you look at these expressions, you will see that given the, pick up, the idle vehicle density A, the values of the idle variables can be determined. So let's go back here. So you look at the first expression there. So everything on the right-hand side of the first expression uh, is exogenous, except for A. So for any given value of A, we can calculate the mean pickup time. And for any given value of A, we can calculate Q. And then given the mean pickup time in Q, we can calculate the D and F. So for any given value of A, we can calculate the other endogenous variables. Now there is another constraint that I haven't mentioned yet. And that is that the total number of vehicles should add up to the given number of vehicles. So the sum of A and B and F should be equal to a row. Okay, so for any for any A that gives us a solution of A plus D, again, D, remember, can be calculated once A is given, plus F, again, F can also be calculated once A is given. So for any given A, if you add up A in the resulting D and F, if it adds up to row, that identifies a steady state of the system. So now what we're going to do is we're going to look at a curve that gives us a plus D plus F is a function of A, and we're going to see where it's equal to a row. All right, and we have two rows here in these figures. The top row is without a cutoff uh, pickup time, and the bottom row is just with a cutoff pickup time. And we can see from this, oh, let me mention in this, in this figure here, we've chosen a row to be one. So the densities are all relative to the number of vehicles. And uh, so the red dotted line you see on the right-hand figures, that, that's the value of a row. And uh, on the right-hand figures, the, the blue curve is the sum of A and D and F. So where the blue curve intersects the red dotted line, those show where the, the steady states of the system are. So we can see in this figure that there can be multiple steady states. And of course, we can also see that in saying that, let's say in the top figure, if a row is too small, then there is no steady state. And of course, that should make sense because if you have too few vehicles, there is no way that you can serve all the right requests um, without discarding some of the right requests. Okay, so if, if a row is too low, there's no steady state. And of course, there's a kind of a knife edge case where there's uh, just one steady state where the, basically the two steady states would coincide. And then for larger values of a row, the more interesting case, uh, there are two steady states. In a minute, I'm going to argue there are actually three, but for now we see the two intersection points. Um, when you have a cutoff uh, of the maximum, I mean, you'll see that kind of the, the part of the blue curve that seems to you know, go, goes up to infinity that's curved back down. And so as a result, that makes then uh, three steady states in, in this figure at least. So in this particular case, um, again, with maximum pickup time, if a row is very low, you can see there will be only one pickup time, uh, sorry, one steady state. And that's with a small value of A. And as we'll um, argue, as you probably understand by now is that that coincides with a very large value of mean pickup time. So small a, very large value of mean pickup time. And then as the red curve is raised up, there will be a knife edge case where there are two steady states. And then if it increases a bit more where it is at the moment, there are three steady states. And if you increase it even more, there will be one steady state. 
And that steady state will be for a large value of A, which will result in small pickup time. And that makes sense. With a large number of vehicles, there'll be a steady state where there are lots of idle vehicles and small pickup time. Okay, the interesting case here, now we kind of have a scarce resource, then vehicle time is, well, let me put it like this, um, for this system to be operated economically, um, there should be enough vehicles, but not too many. So I think these cases with multiple steady states that we see here, that's kind of the, the economic zone of operation. So that's the interesting case. So we have three pickup times um, when there's a cutoff for, for the maximum, three steady states when there's a cutoff for the maximum pickup time. Let's go back up to the, the top figure. Um, I want to point out, it's not so obvious from a figure, but there are actually three steady states there too. Because at A equal to zero, the mean pickup time is infinite. But that's in a certain sense also a steady state. It's just not obvious from this figure. So in, in both of these figures, in fact, have three steady states. Um, we'll see in a little bit that not uh, all of these steady states are stable or attracting. So in this case, it's the two steady states um, on the two sides. So the smallest one and the largest one here, they're both stable. And then the one in the middle is unstable, meaning that if you start, if the system starts close uh, to the middle steady state, but not exactly at it, but close to it, it will wander off the dynamics will move the state to one of the two stable steady states, either to the one with large A or to one with small A. Next, we want to look at the performance of these, um, the system at the different steady states. And so the performance that we look at here is the service rate. So that's the, the rate at which write requests are served. And the other is the mean pickup time. And the steady states are numbered here, one, two, three, from left to right. So one has a small value of A, the density of idle vehicles. You can see it also has a low service rate because a lot of the write requests have to be rejected. They have to be discarded because the pickup time is too large and the mean pickup time is, is also large. And then for the steady state number three, the one on the right has a larger density of idle vehicles and a larger service rate because fewer, fewer riders are, uh, ride requests are discarded and it has a smaller pickup time. So I think it's clear here that steady state three has much better performance than steady state one. And as I mentioned earlier, Steady state one and steady state three are the two stable steady states. And steady state two, the one in between is the unstable steady state. Okay, I hope this kind of simple model gives some of the intuition of the issues that need to be addressed. So what we're going to do next is um, look at uh, an optimization model that has more details that I think are of more practical interest to a ride hailing um, marketplace. Um, so as I mentioned, the model that we used in this previous analysis is very idealized. It's a deterministic model. The space is homogeneous. It has no boundary. The demand is homogeneous. The state variables are continuous variables. Then they're time invariant. And as I've mentioned before, so these models have been used by several authors um, for different purposes. Um, now we want to uh, put the some more realism into these models and we also want to put controls into these models. The controls we're interested in again are pricing and reposition. So we're going to, instead of a deterministic model, we're going to con consider a stochastic model, specifically a mark of decision process. And we're going to partition this region of interest into zone. Where we can model the inhomogeneity of space. We're going to model demand in more detail. So we're going to assume that different right requests, uh, right, right requests for different origin destination pairs uh, occur at uh, different rates. And then uh, the uh, probability that the 
the rider will accept our ride offer will depend on both the price as well as the pickup time in a way that I'll describe in a little bit. Um, we're going to have states that track the, the status of the different vehicles over time. So whether they idle and where they are idle, where they're busy with uh, pickup travel, where they're busy with on-trip travel, etc. Now, models like this, now that, that partition the region into zones um, that keeps track of the states of the vehicles, et cetera, have been used in at least those two papers. Um, however, those papers ignore the, the kind of the core topic of this work, of our work, and that's this trade-off between pickup time and idle time. In fact, both of these papers uh, assume that pickup time is zero, always. And um, they either consider pricing or repositioning, but not both. And we're going to consider both. And we can also, I'm going to show you later how much of a contribution pricing or repositioning makes to the optimization of the system. All right, so I've mentioned states. So let me add a little bit more detail there. So the state of this market decision process includes the number of vehicles that are idle in each zone that are on trip between every pair of zones, that are repositioning between every pair of zones, and that are busy with pickup travel. Um, and uh, we're going to, as I ex will explain in just a little bit, the pickup travel um, will involve a, a zone pair, the pickup zone and the destination zone, but also a pickup time category. Um, as I said, I'll explain that in just the pickup time category in just a little bit. And our decisions, as I've mentioned, will be, be origin destination pricing and repositioning, which is allowed to depend on the current state of the system. So both prices and the repositioning may depend on the current state, as is typical for a, for a mark of decision process. All right, now it's it should not be a surprise that this mark of decision process is intractable. And the main reason is that the state space becomes very large, even for small values, for, red, for moderate values of the number of vehicles. So even for five vehicles or say 10 vehicles, no very small system like this, the mark of decision process is already intractable. Um, so our, now we have to do something about that. And our approach is going to start off with something that is widely used in, the, um, in this community. And that is to formulate and solve a fluid optimization problem that is associated with this mark of decision process. Now, typically the fluid optimization problem is obtained from the mark of decision process by just replacing all the random variables with their means and allowing the discrete variables like discrete cars, et cetera, to have fractional values. And that's also why it's called a fluid model. Okay, and then a typical approach is this fluid optimization problem is then solved and the optimal solution of the fluid optimization, <laughs> sorry, the optimal solution of the fluid optimization problem is used to compute policies for the market decision process. And there are various ways in which the, this can be done. But as I'll tell in a little bit, the typical way is simply take the optimal solution of the fluid optimization problem, use the decisions in this optimal solution, prices or repositioning decisions, and simply apply it to the market decision process. And then you can evaluate such policies. And you can evaluate them with theoretical results, such as asymptotic optimality or regret bounds, um, or you can do numerical simulations or, or both. Okay, so that's uh, roughly is going to be our approach too, but you will see that there will some interesting things will happen along the way. And the first thing that happens is, the first obstacle, is that even when we replace the random variable, in this case, the random pickup time with its mean, and which we've derived before, the resulting fluid optimization problem still is intractable. It's a non-convex optimization problem. And it, it does not seem to be uh, amenable to reformulation as a tractable 
Markov decision problem. Uh, sorry, tractable fluid optimization problem. All right, so we have to address the tractability of this of this fluid optimization problem. So we have to follow a different approach. So just a reminder here. So we have expressions for the mean pickup time. And as I just mentioned, these expressions don't seem to allow the fluid optimization problem to be made tractable. We also have an expression for the cumulative distribution function of, of pickup time. And that, that expression is repeated um, at the bottom of the screen. And um, I want you to note that it is concave in the endogenous variable. Our endogenous variable here is the idle car density A. And that's going to help. So that gives us the, the hint that maybe we should not just use the mean pickup time when we formulate the fluid optimization problem. Maybe we should try to leverage the concavity of the distribution of pickup time. And so that's going to be our approach. So we formulate now a fluid optimization problem that uses the distribution of the pickup time rather than merely the mean pickup time. And specifically what we're going to do is we're going to model the pickup time distribution with a mixture of exponential distributions. Again, we want it to be exponential because we uh, have a continuous time MDP. And as you know, in continuous time MDP, all the transition times are uh, exponentially distributed. And we're going to have a mixture, a finite mixture. We want it to be finite because we the, the, the number of um, elements in this mixture will affect the size of the state space. And so we want the state space to be finite. So there's going to be a finite mixture of exponential distributions and a mixture distribution. So the probabilities that are put on a different exponential distributions, those probabilities will depend on the idle vehicle density in a way I'll describe in, in, in just a minute. Okay, so to describe that, Let's first look at a very simple example, and then I'll describe it in more general. And in more general, so let's say we look at this area um, with a radius of the speed times the the maximum pickup time, and this this area is centered at the rider's pickup location. Okay, and let's imagine we partition this area into k sub areas. So that's going to be the so you can probably can guess that will make up the mix that will affect the mixtures of the mixture of exponential distribution. All right, so in this picture, they're concentric circles, but that's not the important thing. Okay, and then what we're going to say is the following we're going to look at which of these sub areas the closest idle vehicle is, and then. Um, if this say the closest idle vehicle is in the K sub area. In that case, given that the pickup time will follow an exponential distribution with a mean that depends on k, so a mean that will denote with one over new k. Um, so more general description of this for every zone i, we can to choose a number of pickup time categories. So it's this, the number of categories we'll denote with ki, and we specify the mean pickup time uh, the mean of this exponentially distributed pickup time for each of these categories. And let's say we sort them from small to large. So one over new one is less than one over new two, et cetera. It's just easier to think of it that way. And then also think of a parameter delta IK is the total area of the first K sub area. So this is the, this is a cumulative area. Um, from from uh, sub area one up to sub area k, and because it's cumulative, of course the the delta value should be increasing in k as shown there at the bottom. And uh, let's say sigma i is the total area of zone i. So in that case, we can use our earlier calculations to calculate what is the probability that the pickup time for a right request in zone I is in category K. And that probability expression is shown there at the bottom of the screen. So that, that calculation comes from our earlier calculations that we did for the simplified model. 
Okay, and so it'll be useful to also calculate the cumulative value of these QI Ks. So the next expression there is simply the, the sum of the QI Ks up to say uh, any, any particular K, again, as a function of the idle vehicle density, and we get that expression. And you can again see that that expression, that's concave, the right-hand side is concave in the idle vehicle density AI. So that is nice for us, except that, so we have a constraint that's concave on the right-hand side. Um, that's nice, except that's an, it's an equality constraint. So concavity doesn't help very much if it's an equality constraint, but at least now that suggests that we may want to look at the relaxation of this. So up there now we have the relaxation where we've converted to an inequality where the right hand side is concave. So less than equal to a concave function in A. So that uh, will give us in the fluid optimization problem, a concave constraint. So this is a relaxation and it has concave, um, or let me say, it's a convex with convex feasible set because we have a, uh, less than equal to constraint to that concave function on the right hand side. But of course, we've relaxed it. And so there's a, a question. So if we've solved this convex relaxation now, how are we going to get an optimal solution for the regional problem where it should be an equality? So fortunately, we were able to show that at optimality, at an optimal solution of the convex relaxation, these constraints for all values of k will be satisfied at equality. And therefore, by solving this convex relaxation, we can recover an optimal solution for the regional fluid optimization problem. So this way, we've converted our original intractable fluid optimization problem that used a mean pickup time, function of idle vehicle density, into a fluid optimization problem that uses not just a, that models not just the mean pickup time, but a distribution of the pickup time. And we've managed to convert this into a, a tractable convex optimization problem. Okay, I'm going to make a few observations. Um, first is, I've mentioned this pickup time is um, modeled as a, with a mixture of exponential distributions. And it has a number of parameters. So Ki, you know, the number of categories, Ki, the mean pickup time in each category, and this value delta over sigma, these are all the parameters of this pickup time distribution. So um, one thing you may want to do is the following. If you have data, for example, on pickup times, you can use the data and uh, tune these parameters to fit your data. And on this slide, I want to show that typically you don't need uh, many categories, uh, K, to obtain a very good fit. So uh, the top row here shows the fit with two categories, the next row with four categories, and the next row, uh, the next row with eight categories. And you can see even with eight categories of pickup time, um, you already get obtain a very, very good fit to, uh, to the to the given blue curve. Next observation I want to make is that, and and papers like Castillo and, uh, and Castillo et al. Uh, they suggest that this maximum dispatch radius, which is equivalent to the maximum pickup time um, we used in our calculations, to improve performance. So they, you know, and their suggestion was that if the pickup this pickup distance is more than the maximum the dispatch radius, the right request is rejected. And then in Stu uh, at all paper, they extended this idea and they proposed that this maximum dispatch radius should be adaptive. So it should be allowed to depend on the state of the system. Um, our approach is uh, different in the following sense that we have prices that are allowed to depend on a pickup time category. And that is a generalization. It's a generalization in the following sense. Um, um, and the previous two papers, um, if, the, if the 
pick up distance or pick up time is less than a cutoff, all the requests are accepted. And if it's more than a cutoff, then all of them are rejected. So with varying the price for different pickup time categories, you can still get the same, but you can also get a more, more nuanced distinction between smaller pickup time and larger pickup times. Uh, so we can exert a finer control over the acceptance choice probabilities and the resulting, the pickup distribution, pickup time distribution of the rides that are accepted by the riders. Um, the next observation, somewhat related to the previous one, is that if you calculate the optimal choice probabilities of the riders um, coming from the fluid optimal solution, then these optimal choice probabilities are decreasing in the pickup time. So small pickup time, large optimal choice probability, and large pickup time, smaller optimal choice probability, so it is, it is like the other two papers, except that it's not all zero and then suddenly jumps down to one. It can have a more gradual transition from large choice probabilities to small choice probabilities. Um, this obstacle that we just talked about, the intractability of the original fluid optimization problem, that's not our only obstacle. Um, we have another obstacle, and that's uh, that the typical policy that would be derived from the fluid optimization problem, unfortunately, does not, it's not a good one. Um, unlike most other settings in which uh, a fluid model is used to control, uh, to solve a stochastic optimization problem. Um, so um, we're going to say how we are dealing with this obstacle next. Okay, so let's go back and just a reminder. So we formulate and solved a tractable fluid optimization problem associated with the MDP. And so typically this solution is then used to compute policies for the associated MDP. And as I mentioned, the typical approach is to just, just use the optimal values of the decision variables for the fluid optimization problem to make decisions for the MDP. So that's called an open loop or a static policy. Um, so in this particular case, it would mean that the optimal prices coming from the fluid optimization problem are used as static prices for the MDP. And the optimal repositioning flows for the fluid optimization problem are used to compute repositioning probabilities for the MDP. All right, and next I'm going to show that such a policy that you know, the typical policy that would be derived from a fluid uh, optimization problem can lead to very poor performance for, for this particular MDP. All right, so um, to describe this, let's first make a connection between the MDP and the fluid optimization problem, because I, 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 I didn't show all the details of the, of the MDP and the fluid optimization problem. So I just want to give some sense of the connection between the two. So uh, this is, a, I think, a fairly typical argument. So you consider a sequence of scaled MDPs. In this particular case, they scaled by the number of vehicles and uh, the rates at which write requests are received. Okay, and then as the scaling, as, you, as this is scaled up, the scale, sequence of scaled processes converges to a fluid dynamic process. And this fluid dynamic process, of course, is consistent with our fluid optimization problem. So they have the same constraints. Um, and the, so, um, yeah, so, um, I think it should be somewhat intuitive to understand a solution of the fluid optimization problem is a steady state um, or a fixed point or a stationary point of this fluid dynamic process. So if you let me maybe state this a bit more specifically, if you take an optimal solution, any solution, in fact, take any solution of the fluid optimization problem, there are two types of variables there. There are the control variables and there are the state variables in this fluid optimization problem. If you use the state variable part of the solution of the fluid optimization problem, that gives a steady state of the fluid dynamic process 
if the fluid dynamic process is controlled by the decision variables coming out of the solution of the fluid optimization problem. All right, so the fluid optimization problem gives a, a, a fixed point or a steady state of the fluid dynamic process. Now, it should not be surprising to you, based on our initial calculation, that may not be the only fixed point. All right, so to illustrate that, let's consider just a simple example with a single zone. And in this example, there's no repositioning. There's just one zone, right? So no repositioning needed. We only going to do processing. And so there are K pickup time categories. So we're going to choose K different prices for the K pickup time categories. We're going to note with A, the fraction of vehicles that are idle. And then D1 through DK will be the fraction of vehicles busy with pickup travel for each one of the K categories. And then F will denote the fraction of vehicles that are on track. Okay. And the prices, as we discussed before, will determine the rider's choice probabilities and we'll denote that with P1 through PK. So using that, we can write this, the steady state equations for this fluid dynamical system. The Q case, as before, that's just the, the probability um, that a ride request falls in, in pickup category K, a pickup time category K. And the next expression for DK is derived from Little's law as before. And similarly, expression for F is derived from Little's law as before. And the last equation just says that the total, the sum of all the vehicle densities um, should add up to one. One year is that we normalized all the, the vehicle density. So the total number of vehicles is equal to one. All right, so we have the system of equations. And as before, given A, for any value of A, you can calculate the value of all the others, and you can see what the solutions are. And by now, this curve should not be uh, surprising to you. Um, so it's, it's a slightly different model than we had before, but we get the same behavior as we had before. There are multiple fixed points. And in this particular example, again, there are three fixed points that you can see there. And the fixed point on the right-hand side is the one that corresponds to the fluid optimal solution. So as I said before, fluid optimal solution gives you a fixed point, but it's only one of them. And that's the good fixed point. The fluid optimization problem is going to choose the good fixed point. But unfortunately, there are other fixed points that are not so good. And in this particular example, there are two more fixed points and they are bad. So to illustrate this, um, and just have a different view of this, um, let's do the following. So um, maybe let me go back to the previous slide. So there are three fixed points on the horizontal axis here, we have A. But as I've mentioned here, for any given value of A, you can calculate all the other steady state values of the state variables, or the Ds and an F, et cetera. And so that gives you a state vector, state vector in, and I mentioned the number of categories plus two. Okay, so now we want to look at this in, this, in the space of the state vector. Now, unfortunately, it's difficult for me to show a picture in K plus two dimensions. So what we did is the following. There are three fixed points. This, these three fixed points define, a, you know, there's a two-dimensional hyperplane that contains all three fixed points. Two-dimensional hyperplane through the space that contains all three fixed points. And so I'm going to show you the dynamics of this dynamical system uh, on this hyperplane that contains all three fixed points. And that is what we see here on this figure here. So we have the three dots you see there are the three fixed points. The one at the bottom right is the, the good fixed point. So that's the one chosen by the fluid optimization problem with a large value of A. The one at the origin, it's zero, zero on the bottom left. That's the middle fixed point. That's the unstable one. And then the one at the top left, that's the fixed point with a small value of A. So that's the bad one. Um, the arrows here denote 
the direction of the dynamical system. So it's the, these are the derivatives of the dynamic equations. So the arrows show you in which direction the fluid dynamical system will move if it's at this, is it, it's that particular point in the state space. So as you can see from there, um, the red arrows, if you follow the red arrows, it will eventually go to the red fixed point in the top left. If you follow the black arrows, those will eventually go to the black fixed point at the bottom right. And there's a boundary between the red region and the black region. So if you're exactly on that boundary, then a trajectory should take you to the unstable fixed point. But if you're just a little bit off that boundary, it will go to the red one, the bad one, or the black one, the good one. So the point is here that you know, in a fluid dynamical system, you might choose this good fixed point, but that's no guarantee that your dynamical system is going to go to the good fixed point. It might go to the bad fixed point. So the next figure shows you some trajectories. And of course, uh, so the, the two at the top and then the middle one on the left, um, these, they start with relatively large initial values of A, the number of idle vehicles. So those trajectories all go to the good fixed point that has a fraction of idle vehicles of about 0.5. And then if the initial number of idle vehicles is slightly smaller than that, um, so that the two pictures on the bottom as well as the one in the middle on the right-hand side, you can see that the number of idle vehicles, A, will go to almost zero. So those will go to the bad fixed point, which was at the top left. Um, so depending on the distance, the fluid dynamical system might converge to uh, good fixed point or a bad fixed point. The next point here is that the, the stochastic system has behavior but it's not exactly the same. Um, so this mark of the mark of chain associated with this mark of decision process, this mark of chain is communal. Single recurrent class of states. So it um it it does not separate into two mark of chains, one with a good fixed point and one associated with bad fixed point. So they communicate, but nevertheless, its dynamics will resemble the dynamics of the fluid dynamical system. And the, the pictures here show it. So the figure on the left hand side show a simulated sample path um, for the mark of chain. And the picture on the right hand side shows that dynamical, the solution of the um, the fluid dynamical system. So this picture show that if the initial condition is in a neighborhood of a bad stable fixed point, so where the number of idle vehicles is small, the mark of chain will also move towards the bad fixed point. And it will, it, of course, it's still a random, so it will jump around, but will jump around in the neighborhood of the bad fixed point. Um, there's more bad news, and that is even if this mark of chain starts close to a good fixed point, it may eventually wander off to a neighborhood of the bad fixed point, right? Because that is a communicating mark of chain. And that's what this this example illustrates here. The top figure here shows. Hi, Anton. If you can huh? converge to the, to the conclusion, we are kind of a bit uh, short of time. So... All right. I, I, thank you, George. I, I've almost finished that, so. Thank you. All right. So this example shows, so it starts initially, the number of idle vehicles is large. For some time, it stays in a, around 0.4 or so on. So that's in the neighborhood of the good fixed point, and then it wanders off towards the bad fixed point. And so this Markov chain can exhibit um, bad behavior, even if you started a good initial state. So what to do about this? So what we did is we, we've formulated to construct a different type of policy uh, that we call closed loop policy. A closed loop policy, it, as the name indicates, it does depend on the current state of the system. And more specifically, it does depend on the number of idle vehicles in the pickup zone. And the figure on the right shows the kind of the dynamics of this, this particular uh, uh, um, um, a fluid dynamical system under our control um, with the same three fixed points. And as you can see, and under our control, 
um, the dynamical system moves towards the, the good fixed point. All right, so next I want to show you some um, of the performance results um, for under our policy. Um, first is we showed asymptotic optimality of our proposed closed loop policy. And we did this in the usual way. So we show convergence of the Markov chain under our policy to uh, a dynamical uh, system as the number of, um, as the scale of the Markov. And then we show that this fluid dynamical system converges to the optimal solution of the fluid optimization problem. We also compared um, the performance of different policies, including our own, with simulation. So let me show you the simulation results. Um, so this is for a, a small example that we copied from the Braberman uh, uh, paper. There are five strings, um, number of vehicles. We simulate this over uh, my, my 10 replications of the simulation, and we're going to show the results here. So in, in, this, in these results, there are three rows in this figure. The three rows are three instances, so three sets of input uh, values for the dynamical system. There are three columns. The three columns are three policies. The middle column corresponds to our policy. The left column corresponds to the policy that's more similar to the Castillo policy, where they do dynamic, just dynamic pricing. And the right policy is similar to um, the, the policies in the other papers that ignore pickup. Okay, and then a dotted line you see there, that's the optimal solution of the corresponding fluid optimization problem, which gives an upper bound on the performance of the stochastic system. So you can see that uh, in the middle column, the performance under our policy is higher than for the other two policies. And you can also see that in the, in the right hand column, when it's assumed that pickup time is zero, there fluid optimization problem is a very optimistic estimate of the actual performance. It's, it's way over optimistic. And the last figure I want to show is, uh, because I think it provides some insight, is the, the, the average number of idle vehicles under the 10 um, sample parts um, for the three types of policies. Again, the three columns correspond to the three policies and the three rows to the three instances. The dotted line here is the, the fraction of idle cars that's optimal, that's, uh, that's obtained from the fluid optimization problem. And the dots that you see there are just the average the number of idle cars, or average fraction of idle cars um, obtained from the 10, 10 sample parts. So you can see the middle column that corresponds to our policy. The, the fraction of idle cars is close to what's required by the optimal solution, and that variability is small. Whereas for the other two policies, the variability of idle cars is all over the place. All right, I hope this, um, um, you found this interesting and insightful and you learned something new about the right thing today. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions that there are. Uh, thank you very much, Dan. Tom. So this was a uh, yes, truly uh, uh, interesting uh, uh, presentation, and the problem is pretty complex. So you went in great detail, but I think the the you know the scientific uh, uh, intuitions is is quite excellent, and and surely the modeling details are extremely interesting. So uh, as it is this uh, lack of convergence, you know, in the case of the open loop, which is an instability of the system, that's very, very interesting. So I would ask, uh, uh, so we are quite short of time, but maybe we can have some uh, questions. You can write, either open up uh, the microphone or just write on the, on the chat. Uh, there was some early exchanges. Now I, I wouldn't go back to those exchanges and uh, 